As the leader in business analytics, SAS lets you harness data to improve clinical research, deliver sales and marketing insights, and help the entire organization make better decisions faster. This episode of Pharma Faceoff is brought to you by Welcome to Pharma Face Off. I'm Barbara Ryan, and here today I have some experts to discuss the challenges of R&D productivity, which clearly have dogged the pharmaceutical industry over the last several years. Uh, most companies are trying to attack this problem in many different ways, addressing both the risk and the return. Uh, and I have joining me uh, two experts who have taken two somewhat different paths. Uh, Renee Cohen, who's VP Strategy at Shire, who will talk to us about the search and develop model, and Dr. Ray Jupp, who runs the um, fibrosis therapeutic unit at Sanofi, who will talk to us about uh, the internal development uh, opportunities. Also joining us today to discuss this topic are Ken Caton from the Center for the Study of Drug Development at Tufts, and Charlotte Sibley, um, an industry consultant who has expertise both um, working extensively in the pharma and biotech industry most recently at Shire. So Renee, how do you develop the expertise internally to make the right external decisions? Well, what we do is we really focus on therapeutic areas. So our first big decision is what therapeutic areas or what indications within those therapeutic areas we wanna go after. And how we build it up initially is through what we call a corner property. Mm -hmm. So we acquire a company that comes with a launch product along with all the infrastructure around it, a sales force, uh, manufacturing capabilities. And then what we do is we provide, we go out and get bolt-ons, whether they're development products or already launched products, to go around it to create a fully formed business unit over time. And what's your core competency in this? I mean, what makes a partner choose Shire? A lot of companies that have full-fledged R&D, they have a not invented here syndrome that's prevalent in the company. For Shire, because we don't have those internal R&D capabilities, our partners or potential partners know that their assets will be a priority for us because it's not competing against anything internally. So maybe, Ray, I'm assuming that you're also looking at internally developed candidates as well as those on the outside that you may want to license in. It doesn't matter to us whether the product is coming in from the external world or one that we generate in-house. We're looking for the best products for those patients. And you know, we think that there are good products externally. Uh, we're looking to bring those in, but we also see that there are gaps. Not every product externally is ideally what the patient needs. The industry is also looking to partner with academia to improve their basic early stage discovery. Uh, and you know how you think that's going and how this relates to what, what these models are pursuing. Uh, I think Ray brings up a very important point. There are very significant unmet medical needs right now, but I think it's fair to say that based on the business model this industry has used over the last few decades, it's broken. It's not working for this industry. And the industry needs to make some very difficult decisions about where to invest its resources and what gives the greatest opportunity to, to achieve returns on those resources. And I think the alignment into specific disease areas is something that a lot of companies have looked at over the last few years, and it certainly are looking at more and more now with the opportunity to achieve partnerships with academic institutions, patient groups especially that are playing a much more active role in these areas, uh, small biotech companies that may be interested in this area as well, public-private partnerships. I think where the industry is realigning into something, the equivalent of an innovation node, which in the case of scleroderma may be one of those nodes where all of these various stakeholders will be participants and will be able to diversify the risks. That certainly will yes. be an important part of it. But another part of it is it'll be able to leverage the different capabilities of all of these various sectors. And that's something that the industry has not really done that well and that much of in the past. 
but clearly we're moving in that direction. We see it in Alzheimer's disease. We saw it in AIDS back in the early 1990s, where there was an alignment of academic centers, of individual researchers, government institutions, patient groups, and industry. And the result was quite a few AIDS drugs that were brought to market. I think it's time to return to that, and I think some of the uh, ideas that Ray has discussed is is an indication that industry is moving in that direction right now. You brought up a very good uh, example with interfacing with academics. So we've recently done a, a collaboration with uh, an academic group based up in Canada at uh, Sunnybrook. This is uh, Professor Dan Dumont's lab. And he's come up with a very early prototype molecule uh, that is an agonist of the type 2 receptor that has shown some very interesting data within some uh, preclinical models of wound repair. But he doesn't really have the ability to, to drive that product um, into development and then push it um, in, into the clinic. And I think that that's really uh, where we, as a pharmaceutical industry, can play mm -hmm. a good role. It, it requires an understanding of, of the product in research. It requires uh, pushing that prototype uh, through the necessary assays in order to, to prepare the IRD documentation. Being an academic and being part of my university's attempts to partner more with industry, there's a real commitment to, to attain that. And certainly there's a lot of support through the NIH and even through the FDA to create partnerships. The problem is that academics generally don't understand how to develop a product and there, there's no reason for them to really be involved in the commercialization of new drugs or any kind of therapy. What you're doing with your partner in Canada and I, what I see other successful partnerships do is actually provide the kind of coordination and management of those early stages of translational research that enable academics to essentially get the most out of their research. I think one of the difficulties might be the either or, and we might be going more to a hybrid model. We haven't really been great in this industry about learning from other industries, and I think there may be a little more receptivity. Years ago, Hollywood divested, and rather than the, um, the movie studios making everything, now it's all independence, but the movie studios are taking a piece of some of the business. So I think some of those hybrid models, I think one of the difficulties is we may not know for 20, 10 or 20 years if they work. As Ken said, it, we've known now for a while that the decades old model, several decades, is broken. Now it's going to take five, 10 years to sort it out, but we won't know for a while. So it might be that the hybrid, that and good ideas can come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then it's the core competencies, the, the internal leadership that you need to really make those good ideas sourced from anywhere and then to develop them. What do you think, if any, are the merits of kind of introducing um, a financial discipline which says, not from the bottom up, here's the amount of money we need, but here's the amount of money you get and you need to find a way to generate the best return from that. Well, I think that that is one of the advantages for us in, in terms of structure. When you break it down into small units and you give everybody in that unit a budget to work with, they become much more respectful of what it costs to do research, or what it costs to do development. Uh, and people begin to look after that money as if it were their own. Uh, indeed, it is in, in many ways, because if they choose to do one thing, they can't do another. And how do you manage that um, in the companies that you acquire? Because obviously one of the appeals is they get the money to fund right. their development efforts, but at the same time, you have to have an element of discipline. As we go out and do partnerships with companies, we actually try to minimize the upfront payment, mm -hmm. because that way we're both focused on the same goals to find clear endpoints for each of the go, no-go decisions. Mm -hmm. So we all agree on what is what does success look like? And it's very easy then to trigger, do we continue this partnership? And at that point in time, if the results are positive, then certainly the partner gets more, more cash out of that. But that also means that we're closer to having a launched product. So everyone's focused on the same goals. At the same time, we have clear lines of delineation of responsibility, since they are the R&D part we're thinking more in terms of the regulatory and the commercial aspects of this and making sure, as Ray mentioned before, it continues, we continue to go towards endpoints that link to unmet needs out there in the patient population. Now, I'm wondering if you get any kind of pushback from small companies, which many of which are cash strapped now, mm -hmm. and to delay payment to them until you get positive results couldn't be an impossible relationship for some of them. So how do you manage those types of relationships? Signing the agreement, they get a certain amount of cash, and it should be enough 
to help. Then we also help fund that next level of uh, clinical data that's going to be generated. So they may be putting some money into it, but we are also. So we want to make sure that mm -hmm. if we think this asset's a good asset, that the partner is actually going to make it through this with, uh, with an operation. How do you think about the, the profile of your portfolio? Or do you think about it in terms of risk? So you have the um, opportunities that are very risky, mm -hmm but obviously low probability. Do you try consciously to have a sprinkling across that spectrum, or are you really just going for the unmet medical need irrespective of that? Well, we, we see that there are four quadrants, as people normally do, you know, high risk, high reward, and you know, we obviously um, try to to limit how much we have in that space. We have the space where uh, we have um, high reward and low risk, which everybody would like to have. Uh, but, but unfortunately, there are a few of those uh, these days. So, so, so we clearly map out the portfolio into the four uh, quadrants. And what we believe that we have to do to, to be successful in the marketplace today is, is to have innovative drugs for patients. We, we've got to get beyond a small incremental mm -hmm. improvement. And I think that if you can point to one failing of the industry, that would be it for me because we've spent too much time trying to get small incremental Im improvements. Historically, we would have been in the lower risk mm -hmm. and we'd be willing to take the lower reward because we'd add all those together to get to our portfolio. But now that we're of a certain size, we are able to take a little bit more of those higher risk um, uh, plays out there. We're not going to go fully into the high risk, but we're able to add a few when we feel comfortable that we know enough about that particular area that we'll take that calculated risk. And I think as an industry, we need to get uh, more uh, out of the box in terms of the types of, of solution we come up for. It's not just who can do the best basic research anymore. I, I think it's who can do the best uh, applied uh, research and, and be able to uh, translate that uh, research most effectively uh, into the clinic for the benefit of, of patients. Before you said the industry needs to move away from incremental innovation and move more towards new innovation or new, new approaches, and yet most of what you just described is incremental innovation. It's better delivery systems, better approaches, better uh, lower toxicity profiles or better pro toxicity profiles. Um, all of that is really the essence of incremental innovation. I think this is one of the conundrums because how many step four may be significantly different from step one, mm -hmm. but steps two and three, if you think of the cephalosporins, for example, will we never have that incremental innovation again? And I guess the question is, which is better, you know, an outsourced model or an insourced model for seeing those potential links? I think the intersection of drug diagnostic and device is going to be critical. And pot potentially, if you're focused only on the drug, you might not think that. But that could happen both in an in insourced and an outsourced model. So I think it, it again, might be the approach that you take to it and the leadership um, of that, of the whole situation. What you're both saying is that, you know, among your core competencies is a basic understanding of the disease areas that you're pursuing. And I think far too often people think about the changing model as pharma companies are becoming development companies. Um, and, and you're both saying something very different than that. So on behalf of Pharma Faceoff, I want to thank all of you today for your participation, your great comments, and your contributions to such an important subject. So thank you, Ken, Renee, Ray, and Charlotte. I um, also want to thank all of you for tuning in and invite you to listen in to our next Pharma Face Off, which is going to be, I think, pretty exciting, managed care versus uh, the copay card. Uh, and we also invite all of you to join the conversation. So please send us your feedback, your questions, your comments, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Pharma Face Off. Thank you. <laughs>